everyone. Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now let's get into our conversation. What's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Scores Table Podcast. And today we have another SU legend on. Went to Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Played at Syracuse from 1996 to 2000. Was an All-American, All-Big East, Most Improved Player. Defensive Player of the Year two times in conference. Eventually drafted in 2012 overall. Um, to the Dallas Mavs and eventually going to Washington Wizards and the 11-year NBA veteran played for the Wizards, Thunders, and Hawks, Etan Thomas. I appreciate you coming on, man. What's going on, sir? How you feeling? All good. I'm feeling good, man. We I think Q's Nation is uh, feeling pretty good right now. Yeah, they should. <laughs> they should. We're rolling on to the Sweet 16. So should be all smiles in Syracuse right now. Absolutely. So, so let's start. Uh, with you growing up in Tulsa uh, who really put the ball in your hands and uh, you know tell me a little bit about you know growing up playing in Tulsa well I was born in Harlem so that's okay. why okay. I first started playing ball and started doing you know but then I moved to Tulsa when I was young my father got transferred with American Airlines so that's how I ended up in Tulsa but all okay. my family from both sides were all from New York you know from from Harlem on my mother's side and from Mount Vernon in the Bronx on my father's side. So I spent all my summers in New York. So I always get the question like, <clears throat> why didn't I go to Oklahoma schools? You know what I mean? Like people was actually pretty, actually they booed me at the state game when they announced I was going to Syracuse. I never forgot that, but yeah. <laughs> is I always wanted to play in the Big East. Like I, I went to Big East games with my grandfather when I was young. And seeing the battles of like, you know, Syracuse and Georgetown and, you know, uh, Seton Hall, Providence, St. John. So that's, I just love that style. And then, you know, I, as I was playing ball when I was, when I was younger, I, it, it, it never was really in my mind to go to an Oklahoma school, although I was growing up in Oklahoma, you know, and it just, that's just how it was. <laughs> so what, what age were you when you ended up moving to Tulsa? I was young. I had to be like in, you know, second, third grade, something like that. Okay. But then, okay. like I said, like I said, I'm, I'm in, I'm in New York every summer. So I'm, okay. going, I'm, right. I'm playing ball in the parks in New York yeah. and yeah. I'm, you know what I mean? All around Harlem, all in the city. And so that's, that's why it was, it was like, it's kind of, it's kind of both. So it's a little different. So you're growing up, you're playing, you're going back and forth in the summer from New York back to Tulsa. Uh, but then you end up you playing at Booker T. Washington High School. When did like the, like the recruiting process really, you know, kind of start to hit heavy with you? And in, in what schools were were coming in? We had a special team, you know, around my era, and there's a lot of history with my school. Um, you know, Wayne Tisdale went there. Uh, Richard mm. Dumas, uh, Richard Dumas went there, who was in the championship game with Phoenix. Um, you know, we had Clint McDaniel that went to. The Arkansas and was doing his thing. We have a lot of a lot of talent coming out of, out of Booker T. So, you know, the spotlight was kind of on us always, but I really only had eyes for the Big East. So yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was really just Big East schools. And I kind of let that be known from the beginning that I was really only focused on Big East schools. So, you know, after my freshman year, um, you know, a freshman didn't play like a Booker T. We just, that's just, you know, you were lucky to even make the varsity on first time at Booker T because we just had so much talent. So I remember after my uh, freshman year, my coach, uh, Nate Harris, uh, he, he recently passed away. But I remember that he he um, brought me into his office and he said, okay, you know, he knew that my favorite schools was St. John, Syracuse, you know, Georgetown. So he called uh, Coach Bayheim. Okay. And so, so it, it is the funniest thing. So. You know, remember this after my freshman year, I ain't played at all, right? So he called Coach Bay and he said, "Hey, I got this kid. I want you to keep you keep your eye on him. You know, you you need to have him on your radar. Um, you know, nobody really knows about him right now, but they will soon." And Coach Bayheim was like, "All right, well, um, you know, how how uh, what did he average last year?" And he was like, "Well, he didn't really play last year." And he said, "Oh, okay." He said, "Well, who's recruiting him now?" He's like, "Well, nobody's recruiting him yet." And Coach Bayheim was like. Well, what am I missing here? <laughs> he was like, no, just trust me. And in a little while, you'll hear about him. 
And he said, okay, all right, I'll keep my eye on him. And then surely, you know, a year or two after that, uh, he started recruiting me. So who was, who was the lead recruiter for you uh, coming from Cuse? So it was at Nike camp. Remember they used to have the Nike camps? Yeah. And so that's when Coach Beheim came to the camp and he watched me play for a little while and then he left. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess, I guess he's not really <laughs> feeling me. And, you know, it was like really like a little bit and then he left. And then somehow, you know, I don't know if it was a runner or something. I was like, well, I guess Syracuse not feeling me. And he was like, uh, no, because Ray said he saw all that he needed to see. So, you know, you were definitely on the on, on the list for him, and he was going to go look at other people. But he already liked, saw what he needed to see from you. I was like, oh, yeah. okay, that's what's up. So, I mean, it was really the easy process for me in my mind as far as where I was going. And I always liked Georgetown, too, but at that time, Georgetown had a lot of big men. Yeah. Like they had, it was like loaded. And I talked to Coach Dom Thompson and he talk, told me about all the big men they had. And then he told me about they had like Boomshay Boomshay over in Africa that they knew they was going to bring. And they had like, it was <laughs> Jihadi, it was like Jihadi White. Othello was there at the time, Othello Harrington. Then yes. they had Jihadi, Jihadi White, they had Bubakar Al, they had Jamil Watkins, and they had Boomshay Boomshay over in Africa ready to come. That's like five or six big men. And uh, with Syracuse, we just had Otis Hill. And, you know, he was going to be leaving after my freshman year. So it was, a, you know, it was an easy choice. Yeah, the opportunity to come in and play right away. I mean, hands right. down, that's what you're trying to do. Right. Definitely. So 96, you, you get to Cuse. Um, talk about that transition coming from high school to a major D1 program. And what was, what was your, I guess, uh, welcome to Syracuse basketball moment that year? Talk about well, that a little bit. Well, playing against Otis Hill, because so they had they went to the championship the year before when I was in high school. That was John yeah. Wallace, Houston in the yeah. house, you know what I mean? So that my freshman year was Otis's senior year. And so, you know, I was a skinny cat. You know, I was like, I was like Jesse. <laughs> I was like Jesse Edwards. <laughs> that's just that's how I, that's how I looked. And yeah. Otis just used to just manhandle every practice. And that was when the Big East was like the real Big East. So it's like, you know, in Villanova, you got Jason Lawson. Um, then you got Danya Abram at Boston College. Then you got Jahadi White at, at Georgetown. And you got, you know, every single game is like a big physical, you had a Donald Foyle at Colgate. Remember we yeah. played? Yes, well, like, like literally every single game. So, and you know, when we play someone, and, you know, say if Coach Bay, I'd throw me in a little bit, I just, I would just get pummeled. I'd be trying, you know what I mean? I just wasn't strong enough. And so that first year was rough for me, to be honest with you. I didn't, I'll be honest with you, I wanted to transfer from Syracuse after my first year. I wasn't very, I wasn't happy. I didn't like it. You know, I was having the freshman blues. You know how it is. Yeah. When you, yeah. you know, it, it's just, you could do no right. You know, it was cold. It was snowing. I was yeah. getting homesick. <laughs> I was like, man, forget this place, man. But, you know, uh, I, I didn't obviously didn't transfer and everything worked out. Let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time. Bet Rivers Sportsbook is offering a 250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one play through to turn your bonus into cash money. When you win at Bet Rivers Sportsbook, they pay fast. And now it's even faster with rush pay instant approval for withdrawals. It's safe, it's secure, it's reliable. With March Madness right around the corner, there's never been a better time to give Bet Rivers Sportsbook a try. Go to betrivers.com today or download the Bet Rivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call telephone number 1-800-GAMBLER. So what, I mean, because going into your sophomore year, you get Big East most improved player. You go, you're averaging 11.7 rebounds, four blocks, and then you're shooting right. 61% from the field. Like, what what changed from you going from, you know, that summer, obviously, in the, into your sophomore year to be able to make that impact that you had? Well, for one thing, um, you know, Otis – Otis graduated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, so I yeah. was the center. So that was like a big thing. And it, and it was the difference of being able to play and play through mistakes okay. and being able to play comfortably. You know how it is. So, so, so when you're, when you're not in that, that main rotation, it's like any mistake you make, you're getting taken out. And then you're the one who coach Bayon's yelling at, or you're the yeah. one who's playing. And it's, it's just, it was completely different. And I, 
And, you know, Coach Babe, I'll tell you, I was, I was a little sensitive. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't, I'm not someone who reacted well to Coach Beheim yelling at me. I yeah. did not. And we would butt heads. And it was, you know, and Coach Beheim, it's interesting when I was interviewing him for my, for my podcast, the rematch, he said that, you know, in coaching me, he had to learn how to adjust his style a little bit because it wasn't working. And he's absolutely right. It wasn't working with me. Like, I was like, you know, every time he would yell, I would get mad at him. And then I wouldn't even be thinking about the game or the play or whatever it is I'm supposed to be thinking about anymore. I'd be mad that he was yelling. So I just didn't respond that way. And coaching is a is a tough thing because you have to learn, you know, um, you know, everybody's personalities. It's like when you have kids. So with one kid, this will work. Another kid, that won't work. You have to do something completely different. And another kid, completely something else. So that's kind of what Coach Bayheim had to do with me. But um, you know, sophomore year, I, I so I was playing, and also my between my freshman year and sophomore year, I got in the weight room. So yeah. I stayed up in Syracuse. I ain't even hardly go home. I went home for like a little bit, and I stayed up both sessions. Um, I was taking some summer classes while I was there. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm here anyway. I might take some stuff, and I was just lifting, and I was lifting with the football players. Oh, so okay. I was lifting with like you know Rob Conrad and the offensive linemen and all that, and they in there like. You know, we we lifted like four times a week, right? And it's like we're in there listening to the, they bumping Guns N' Roses and Metallica and that like, you know, that crazy type of lifting. And that's what I was doing all the time. So I came back after that summer. I was swole. Like I was strong. And, you know, I was ready. <laughs> so it, was that in when, when, uh, Manly, right? Yeah, I was in Manly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because we the, the, we used to have the old we, everybody would share the weight room. I know right, football right, had, right. had their own side, but we share with track and volleyball and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, so, they I mean, it's different. That. It's different now, you know. Everybody just in the metal center. We had no metal center, so we right. were in there, out, and I was in there with the football team. I was working out, and you know, football players work out different. They don't work out like how we work out. It was just a whole different regiment, and you know, Corey Parker was our trainer. Uh, the strength coach, he, he let me just, you know, work out with them. And that's what I did that summer. Did that, did that like change your mindset though, going in? Like, yeah, obviously you're, you're confident because your body, you bulked up and you feeling good about yourself, but your mindset too, right? It changed yeah. to going from, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of playing tentative to I'm going ahead. I'm, you know, Listen, that it's a totally different everything because if you have, you have to have seen football players lift weights to see how crazy and intense it is. And that's what I, you know, took to the court after that, that same type of intensity, like where they're like, okay, they're all standing around you and you're trying to get the last one. And they're like, come on, pump it, pump it. And you're like, ah, ah, ah. You know, that is, is that why, why Metallica is playing and Guns N' Roses and you know what I mean? It's like, it's just a whole different type of lifting. And that's what I took, you know, to the court. And then that was my mentality every time. And, and you know, it, it, it paid off. Because, I mean, your junior and senior years, you went back-to-back -back defensive player of the year. You're All-American, All-Big East, one of the best players in the country, a top NBA draft pick – or draft right. prospect, excuse me. Right. I mean, is this something that when you were growing up that you were – that you imagined, like, being at this point? I mean, not I – mean, every dream of it. You know what I mean? But you can't really conceptualize it when you're young, you know, and, and what it – because you don't understand that process. You don't understand – you know, the whole thing is full so funny because kids now, they're more into the process now and understand it. They, they, they go through the process on their video games or they yeah. go through, you know, like we didn't have stuff like that. It was just different. And also they have social media. So they're, you know, in, in more in depth than everybody's lives and how they're going through the process. We just didn't we didn't know that. So, you know, but 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 yeah, no, I, you really don't know what to what you're stepping into until you're in it. And the way the Big East played, that was what I loved, though. I love it. And basketball is different now. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's just totally. a, it's a whole different game. But yeah, but those old Big East games, man, those are those those are great. Those are good times. Yeah, no question. I mean, the old big like like you said, it's it's not the it's not the Big East of old right now. You know, right. it was every single night. I remember it. Does, I don't care if you're playing Rutgers or yeah, you know, uh, whoever it was. When I when I come in, it was we had I think. DePaul, Cincinnati, Marquette, they all joined. But oh, see, we didn't, see, we didn't even have none of them. We didn't have them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Villanova, Georgetown, yes. Connecticut, that's what it right. was. Right, 
Right, right. That's what it was. So what what was it like playing for Coach Beheim? And and give me your favorite story or your favorite moment, your Beheim moment. So it was it was cool. It was like you know you know well after freshman year, the freshman year I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, right. But but after after freshman year, you know I I learned a lot about how he treats you like an adult, and you know he, he expects certain things of you, and you know, it, it was more like how it is in the pros. You know, if you don't want to do these things, then you will not be successful. And it, it's some people can handle that freedom and some people couldn't. And to be honest with you, and it's the same way in the pros. You saw some people there. You didn't have anybody going behind you like, okay, now you got to do a little bit of this. Now you got to do, you know, it was like you had to either do it or you're not going to be uh, having a job next year. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's really as simple as that. No, no question. What, what, what's your favorite, favorite story? Him in the locker room after a game, something that so, really stood out. So I had, I had different relations. I, and it was funny because I just, I was just asked this earlier today. Um, you know, in the form of, you know, my activism and speaking out on things of that nature. And they asked me if I ever had any issues um, with Coach Beheim or issues at, with Syracuse with me speaking out on different things or, you know, stuff like that. Because some programs would rather their players kind of be quiet and just kind of be focused on, on, on you know, playing. And yeah. I was like, well, no, I didn't, I didn't have that, honestly. Um, you know, I remember my freshman year. And now this is the first weekend that I'm even at Syracuse, right? So I, I come to Syracuse and there's this big demonstration happening on the quad with the um, black and brown students. And they're all there because the, 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 the protest was that the uh, campus security was gonna be allowed to use pepper spray. And the, the fear was that they were gonna use it on all the black and brown students. Anytime something happened, they were just gonna pepper spray everybody. So that was the fear. And so I went to the protest and I was there with Roland uh, Williams. Remember Roland Williams, football player? Yes, um, I do. All right. So, so I'm there and we're both there standing next to each other. We ain't know each other, but we just, you know, talking. You play on a football team, I play on basketball. We stood there talking. And so there was, it's the middle of the protest. We're right there. And then the, um, the, the Daily Orange took, has a picture. And it's like, it's us and all the protesters. And, you know, of course, we stick out. So that was in the next day um, in the papers. So Coach Mayhem called me in the office. He was like, hey, um, you know, I saw you in the protest. You know, I, I we we uh we did our history and know that you was into speech and debate and talked about a lot of things and different things while you were in high school. Um, he's like, and listen, I have no problem with you speaking out on anything, just to let you know. He's like, but I will tell you this: that when you do speak out on something, um, be prepared to defend yourself because there are going to be people coming at you to criticize you after that. And as long as you're prepared to do that, you speak out on whatever you want to speak out. And that was my freshman year. I was like, okay, I, I, you know, I respect that. And he was, he never, you know, tried to stop me from activism, never tried to quiet me or anything or anything like that. And I just, it, and it was advice that I really kept my entire life because, you know, you did have to know how to defend yourself and how to be able to, if you're going to step out there and speak on something, there's going to be people who didn't like you and didn't, you know, criticize you, tell, you know, try to say that, you're, you're, you really shouldn't be talking on this topic because you're just a basketball player or something like that. And you had to be able to defend yourself. So that was, that was really my favorite, you know, Coach Bayhai moment because it's something that really stuck with me for the whole rest of my life. Was that, so did, from that point on, did your relationship change with him different just because because he gave you that, you know, that freedom to just to be you? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I, and I definitely respected that, that aspect of it, you know? I mean, yeah, of course, I had the freshman blues because I was, you know what I mean? That, that, yeah. that, you know, but, but as far as that's concerned, and I, and I always talk about it because, um, you know, there's a lot of, it's not like that in every program. It's just not. You know, in other programs, players are being told to be quiet. And that's, especially football players. Now, now, now recently, in the past few years, things have changed and you've seen activism and players and stuff like that. But before, no, they'll, they'll tell you, no, they was told to not get involved in anything. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about your most, we'll talk about coach Bayham, but what's your most memorable game? Your mem most memorable moment of your SU career? Oh, my SU career? Yeah. Um, shoot. We have, have some, Oh, okay. I got you easily. So, um, I, I told you I always wanted to go to, to Georgetown, right? Right. 
And, you know, I talked to Coach Thompson and I was in high school. He said, you know, we have kind of too many big men right now. So we don't, so basically we don't really need another big man, right? So my freshman year, um, it was the game where we're playing Georgetown at the Dome, right? And, you know, Otis got into foul trouble. Elvir, you know, had some personal situations. So he went back home to Bosnia. And I'm yeah. looking, I'm like, is he about to throw me into this <laughs> game? And I and I hadn't played in like 10 straight games or something like that, right? And that's when Jihadi was a monster. Like he's literally like the Shaq of the Big East. Like right. he was 290 and quick off his feet. Like he was like, it was crazy. So I get into the game and as soon as I get in there, uh, John Thompson looked at me and he ran the play. He was like, go inside. And <laughs> literally every single time down the court, it was like a ISO inside for the hottie. They gave him the ball. And he's literally trying to rip the rim down on me every time he touches it, right? So it's at that point, it's either me move out the way or I'm going to just swing at him or something like that. If, you know what I mean? It was like there was no other option. Right. So, yeah. I, so, <laughs> so I set the record for the quickest foul out in Syracuse history. That game, I found out it was like, honestly, like five minutes. Right? <laughs> it was like literally five minutes I found out. <laughs> and, you know, the papers were killing me. The fans was killing me afterwards. And that was the, the Donovan McNabb game. He, yeah, he went on and had a great game. And he okay. played center. Right. And it was it was great. But me... I found out in five minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was, it was just, I, you know, I didn't hear the, you know, I didn't stop hearing about that when I went home. It was terrible, right? Now, the next year came, my sophomore year, right? Now, I told you, I, I, had, I had been training. I was ready. I was pumped. I was, you know, everything like that. So we're, we're playing them at the Verizon Center here in D.C., right? And I go off. Like, off. This is my sophomore year. The first time we played Georgetown, my sophomore year. I mean, I'm blocking everything. Hard dunks. You know what I mean? Like, everything. <laughs> kind of like, I'm, I'm blocking it and just screaming, beating my chest. Like, literally, like I was like a man possessed, right? And so we beat them and everything. So right after that game, I ran uh, right over to Coach Thompson. You know, like when you, you the buzzer sounds and everybody goes to line up? I ran yeah. right over to Coach John Thompson, right? And I shook his hand and I said, you could have had me. <laughs> and then he was like, good game. <laughs> good game. <laughs> and then he That's went, good. right. And then he went. So later on, I'm teammates with Jahadi. And Jahadi tells me what happened after that when they went to the locker room. He said Coach Thompson was so pissed. He said he was throwing stuff. He said he thought they was about to, he was about to steal him. Like it was like bad. But I felt like that was like my moment. Like I felt like I was on top of the world after that. You know what I mean? Because that was just, it was just, that was just amazing. And that was Jahidi's senior year. Senior year, right. So, so after that game, that sophomore year, I mean, I mean, we look at the stats. I mean, everything from your sophomore, junior, senior year went, went up and up. But right, that moment, right, right, right. that moment right there, you think was like the defining moment where like, all oh, right, this was. Yeah, that was it. That but was like, like, I've arrived. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, yeah, I'm here yeah. now. Let's, let's go. You know, and that was, it was, it was great. Absolutely. That's tough. So 2000. 2000, you're drafted 12th mm -hmm. um, lottery. You you went, you got drafted by Dallas, but then uh, right. ended up in uh, ended up in Washington. Washington. But tell me, yeah. tell me about the moment though. Just you know, all the hard work goes into this. This is you know, this is what you strive to do. This is what everyone strives to do. Right. And you get drafted. I mean, who was around you that night? What was the feelings, the emotions? I mean, how how was oh, that? Oh man, it was crazy. You know, all my friends, all my family. You know, moms, pops, everybody there, grandparents. It was it was amazing. Like literally, it was amazing. And it's crazy because, you know, when you're a young player, everybody dreams about walking across the stage and shaking David Stern's hand and putting on the hat and everything like that. It was it was amazing. And it was all smiles. Like I couldn't stop smiling the whole time. You know, <laughs> I remember there was there was some guys that were that might have slipped in the draft and they weren't happy in the back and things like that. And I was just cheesing, just smiling. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was so happy. And I, I remember I saw like Quentin Richardson and Darius Miles and they was cheesing. And then we was all just sitting there cheesing together. Like it was, you know, Kenya Martin was still crying. He was like all emotional because he went number one and he had broken his legs. So he was all emotional and stuff. And it was just, it was just a lot of emotions, you know, going on at the draft. And it was, 
I mean, it was amazing. That's what you worked your whole your whole life for. It ch- changed dudes' lives right yeah. there. I mean, that, with yeah. you know, in an instant. Yeah, just like that. You played eleven years in the NBA. Uh, Wizards, Thunder, Hawks. Mm-hmm. What was what, what was the best organization you would say that you were a part of, and who was somebody that, um, I guess, all, on or off the court, that you were really close with and, and kind of helped you, you know, navigate through your through your career? I mean, I had so much great experiences, you know. But I mean, I when I first got to the Wizards, um, you know, MJ came out of retirement, and I play. I was playing with MJ. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and playing with MJ, it was like. So, so when I got traded to the Wizards, the Wizards were the worst team in the league. <laughs> they were like literally, <laughs> they had won 16 games that year. It was terrible. Like it was bad. And, you know, and I didn't play my, my rookie year because I, I, um, I had to have surgery on my foot. So I came late after the trade. So when I came up there, and I remember Leonard Hamilton was the coach of the Wizards. And I came to the game. The stands was empty. You know what I mean? It was like they was getting beat by like 30. It just looked like the Bad News Bears. It looked terrible, right? So that following year, MJ announces that he comes out of retirement and everything is different. Every game is sold out. Like we had a crowd (laughs) outside of the Verizon Center every game. You know, like every time we landed somewhere. You remember those old, that old footage of like Michael Jackson when he'd be traveling overseas and you were crazy. Thousands of people, you know what I mean? Like that. Or you'd see people like look at him and just start crying or like touch his arm and pass out or something like that. You know, that's how it was with MJ. And we was tripping. Look at it. We was like, dang, this is, they are really out here tripping over this cat, you know? And it was, and he was a cool dude. You know, after a while, after you done gone through training camp and see a person every day, you get kind of used to him. But then we go out somewhere. And you see people's react- reaction to him. And it was like, wow, yeah, we we with MJ. You know what I mean? So it that was that was a crazy experience. Crazy experience. What what was your favorite MJ story or favorite moment? Like where you were like, you know, something that just kind of blew your mind. So there was a lot that happened. Uh, but one thing in particular, there was one game. Uh, I don't remember if this was the first year or the second year. I think it was the first year. Um, and he had a bad game and we lost. Who was playing against Indiana, right? He had a bad game. Um, and, you know, so he was the next game, I believe it was like a back to back. I don't remember, but I remember when I came in, uh, in, in the locker room, he was sitting there reading the paper, right? And it made me think of it when I saw the uh, documentary. Um, what was the documentary that they showed that they had? Just uh, last year? What's the name of it? You know what I'm talking about. Come on, man. You, you, ah! put, me on, you put me on the spot. Yeah, I can't think of it. But anyway, know you too. know. Right, right. I mean, I watched all, all, all parts of it too. So, yeah. so, so last they, dance, last, the last dance. dance, the last dance. There, there you go. go. Thank there you, we go. Tim. Appreciate you. Thank you. Tim. Yeah. So <laughs> they showed a part of him on the last dance, like rocking and, and like reading the paper and getting like like amp. And it had made me have a flashback. So I was like, I remember. I, I walked into the locker room and that's what he was doing. He was reading this article, this paper that was killing him. They were saying, oh, he's too old. He should have never came out of retirement. He's tarnishing his image and his legacy, everything like that. So he's rocking, right? He's like this, biting his lip. Like, uh-huh, huh. And that's what he's just doing, just rocking, right? I don't know if he's reading the same, because it wasn't that long of an article. He must have just right. been reading it over <laughs> and over again, right? So then he went out there and literally put on a show. Like, it was like he scored, like, must have been 40, 45, something crazy. He had the most points of anybody that age ever. Like, he literally put on a show. And I was like, dang, this dude is like, like, I saw, like, the the magic, the MJ magic. And it was crazy because then I saw the same papers that was killing him the day before was praising him. Like, oh, King MJ, like, the great, you know, go, everything like that. And I'm sitting there because my lock was right next to Christian Leitner's, right? And yeah. I was like, I was like, huh? I was like, they just the, the media just changed on him, huh? He was like, look, the media will change on you in a heartbeat. You better remember that. He was like, but yeah, now he's now he's now he's King MJ again. That was like the crazy, wow. like that stuck in my mind forever, you know, for so many different reasons and dynamics. But yeah, I saw it. He was it was it was amazing. It was just amazing I mean, for, for my man to come back though and, and just like still do it do that it's kind of like he had that if he wanted to turn it on yes and, and, and then like you said it took something to kind of make him right you know kind of pick or whatever then that, yeah. that article just set it off for him 
Man, I saw it firsthand. <laughs> I saw it firsthand. Man, I was right there. <laughs> That's special. All right, we yeah. have uh, we have the fan question that we we did on Twitter All right. uh, er, earlier today, and and uh, it's from Chuck St. Andrew. I thought it was I thought it was a good question. Two thousand seven, okay. you have open heart surgery. What was the hardest mm-hmm. part about coming back, and how has that changed your outlook on your life and your career? Oh, that changed everything. Put everything into perspective. So yeah. just so that you know, give you a little background. I had a, a leaky valve, um, you know, since the time I was little. I was like in middle school, I got detected and I was in middle school. And I always knew that eventually that I was going to need to have heart surgery, but I never did win. So at, at the time when I had it with the Wizards, um, you know, I just started starting. I was playing well. I was, you know, rolling and everything like that. And then that next summer, um, you know, I had a great summer, ready to come back and everything like that. And at training camp, like my cardiologist was like, ah, you hear a little something in there. You might have to have surgery. I was like, surgery, I'm good. Like, I'm fine. I feel good. You know what I mean? They were like, yeah, we know you're not going to, you're not going to be able to feel anything, but there's a lot going on in there and, you know, you're going to need surgery. And I was like, oh man. So that like, it was tough. I'm going to tell you, it was tough when I went and I had my surgery. So, so say it was detected in September that I was going to have surgery. Yeah. And that I needed surgery. And then I was having it early in October. I went to a few specialists and, City right to Mayo Clinic, and, and I had a surgery. It was like boom, 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 right? And so after I had the surgery, I remember looking in the mirror, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I had lost, like, 40 pounds. Like, I was so skinny. I was like, I haven't been this size since, like, middle school. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, <laughs> how am I ever going to come back? Like, I was like, what the devil? And so, but it was, I had a great, network of guys that reached out to me um you know tractor trailer uh fred hoiberg um you know ronnie turioff they had all had um heart open heart surgery at some yeah. point and so it became this kind of fraternity and they reached out to me they were like hey whenever you need anything you know don't hesitate to call you know and stuff like that and so i was i was like hey uh, I know it's in the middle of the night, but you said if I haven't needed anything, they're like, no, what's up? And then we were just sitting here and talk. Like, it was it was hard. So then it was funny because after that, after my surgery, there were other guys that had open heart surgery that that I reached out to the same way, like Jeff Green and you know what I mean? Yeah. Different. And it was the same exact thing. And it was just like, you know, a passing it on type thing. But that those guys, man, you know, they, they helped me a lot. They helped me get through it a lot. So... Definitely thankful for that. Yeah, to have that support system when, you yeah. know, having been through it, I mean, that yeah. probably meant everything. Oh, definitely. Definitely, no yeah. doubt. So I, this is what I really wanted to get to because, I mean, I just think it's amazing, like, what you're doing and the impact you're having um, outside of basketball. You know, mm-hmm. so after you're done playing ball, I mean, you, you publish books, uh, you're a motivational speaker, a poet, activist, radio host. Uh, I mean, you made a big name for yourself outside of it. I mean, what, what got – you know, what got you into it? Like, was it early on before you got to college? And, and kind of talk about that process because, um, you know, it, it's pretty, it's motivational and it's an inspiring. It's inspiring to me. So, so then I appreciate that. So, so, you know, as far as the, you know, I was doing speech and debate when I was in high school. Like we were, we were winning state championships in, in basketball, but then we was also winning state championships in speech and debate. Mm, that, was okay. kinda, that was just kind of my thing. And, um, you know, I liked it. You know, I, I like going in there and either performing a, a speech, performing a poem or something like that, or the debate and being able to defend your position, everything like that. It was just always interesting to me. And it's funny because that really wasn't the cool thing to do in high school, but I kind of got a pass because I played on the team. And it was like, all right, that's his thing. But, you know, yeah, so, right. Yeah, right. Well, it really wasn't the cool thing to do. Like, you know, it wasn't like the in crowd was doing the speech or debate. But it was, it was, you know, it was something I had a passion about. And it's interesting because, you know, after that, you know, I'm, I'm really doing a lot with the media now. And I never liked the media. Never liked the media. Yeah. I was always, and I'm going back to why I started doing the media was because I would always see different things that I didn't like. And I remember my, my freshman year, um, I mean, my freshman year at Syracuse, there was a, uh, a cartoon in the Daily Orange, and it was right after Winfred Walton. So I, I don't know if you remember Winfred Walton, but he was yeah. like, okay, all right, you know, all right, because some people forgot about him. 
But Winford Walton was the truth. Like when I say he was the truth, like this dude was about to be special at Syracuse. Yeah. For however long he stayed. If it was one year, he was about to be special for that one year. You know what I mean? Like he was he was really good. And something happened with his test score and stuff like that. And and he, you know, wasn't able to stay at Syracuse. And this 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 reporter wrote this article and made this cartoon making fun of him in the Daily Orange. And I wrote back to him, like in a letter to the editor. And I wrote an article saying, you know, I, I thought it was cowardly to kick a man when he's down and, you know what I mean, defending my teammate. And that was really my first time doing that and going back at a reporter. And I kept doing it, especially when I was with the Wizards, you know, and that was, I would, you know, you see a reporter rip you for some reason. And then I was like, well, let me write this letter to him or write an open letter to him or something like that. Or I'll do research on him and say, well, wait a minute now, you you know what I mean? I got, <laughs> and, and, so I, and I started doing that more and more. So that's when I started doing more writing and more writing. And, you know, it's crazy being now in the media and what I do with the rematch and being able to just, you know, give athletes this platform to be able to tell their story. And a lot of times to retell their story. That's why it's called the rematch, like a redo. And, yeah. you know, it's like, for instance, this, um, you know, coming out this week, we interviewed um, Elijah Millsap. And he was the one from the Utah Jazz that said that, you know, um, the, the GM is now the VP, Dennis, um, um, what's his last name? I can't think of his last name. But that he made the, the racial comment to him. And, you know, and I'm looking and I'm like, well, I don't see anybody writing from his perspective. Or telling his things, every only only the the other person's things and everything like that. So I gave him the platform to be able to tell his story and tell what you know. And, and it's just that type of thing. It, it's really a you know. I never thought that I would be in the media. To be honest with you, never thought I would be in the media. But you know, like what like what I what, you know what I see all in smoke doing with you know Stephen Jackson and Matt Love Barnes it. And Love what it. I see Love like you know uh, Hugh Rich and Darius Miles. You know what I mean? With them Knucklehead. Doing yeah. Knucklehead. I, I love it because former athletes have this rapport with other athletes and it's not like you're on the hot seat and somebody's trying to, you know, tear you down in the media or something like that. They're literally trying to give you a platform to show another side of you, show more of you and tell the complete story and everything like that. So I, I, I'm loving it. You know what I mean? I love what you do. I learned so much about different Syracuse guys that I just didn't know about because it wasn't covered in the media. That yeah. wasn't the, the, the way in depth that you're getting with different guys. All we're told is, you know, how, how they're playing, how they're, you know what I mean? If they're having a slump, if they're shooting well, or what the percentages and stuff like that, it's really focused on that. But you're getting to know the person after they watch your interview. So, I mean, it's just all those former players in the media now, I think it's special. But how, how is important, how important is it to you, um, you know, to use this platform and, and talk about the rematch too a little bit and to give these, you know, these other athletes a platform to, you know, make an impact positively and also at the same time, educate others, right? And oh, get people aware. What, how is that, you know, talk about that a little bit. So as far as the awareness and the activism part, I think that's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's amazing because now, you know, activism only really got popular like maybe a few years ago, you know, <laughs> like it really wasn't the end thing to do for a long time. Um, but athletes have all of these feelings and thoughts and things of that nature and their ability to, to articulate their positions and influence. So, you know, and, and hearing an athlete, and that's this is the reason why the opposition, whatever, whoever the opposition is, looks at the athlete as such a threat because of the power that the athlete voice, you know, has. And when an athlete says something, it resonates throughout the entire country. And so when you see LeBron getting attacked, you know, for, for his stance on whatever the stance is, there's a reason why. You're not going to attack anybody if they're not a threat to you, you know. But when they're a threat, you're like, no, I, I want to try to diminish his voice. I want to be able to discredit him. I, when, when Laura Ingram told him to shut up and dribble, you know what I mean? It was because she disagreed with what he said and didn't want him to influence anybody else. Right. But if she, if she agreed with him, it wouldn't have been shut up and dribble. It would have been, oh, look at this athlete who's standing up for what's right. That's that's the way it is when somebody agrees with you. And so I love it. I love seeing athletes using their voice now, using their platforms and 
speaking out on different things and you know and not, and not just speaking out for awareness standpoint but then also pushing for things to change you know especially this last summer where you saw athletes all over the country you know um you know marching in the streets you know protesting after george floyd was murdered and brianna taylor and everything like that you see them lobbying on capitol hill you know what i mean for for laws to be changed you see the the the, the football coalition what are they called the uh, players coalition like the, and, and all the things that they're doing and every time they come here in dc I, I i think it's great so having that 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 power and that confidence and that support and using your platform and your position i mean that's that's special that's like on the level of what muhammad ali was doing in the 60s that's what john carlos and tommy smith were doing with jim brown like all those you know athletes in the 60s that use their platform as a way to push for for change in society and it's just you know it's just it's just great to see yeah, I mean, it, as as you know, us athletes, our our reach is further than I right. guess the normal public. You you'd mm -hmm. say right, and yeah. and just you know, once you you know do something and you figure that out, like hey, I can make an impact in a positive way. It's I'm gonna continue to do this. You know, there's gonna be people with opinions regardless, of whatever right. you do. But if you know, <laughs> you know, your your intentions are pure and you're trying to do the right thing, like that's you gotta speak up, right? That's just Definitely. I think you're doing a disservice if you don't. Definitely, definitely agree. Absolutely. So let's transition a little bit. We'll talk. Let's talk about the Q's team right now. All right. Uh, yeah, this this Sweet Sixteen run. I mean, what what changed from the beginning of the year? Obviously, there was a lot of issues with COVID and stuff. But what changed from then to now? What's the difference? You know, it's interesting watching them, and <clears throat> they really started to come together uh, towards the end of the year uh, in a real special way. And you saw that happen last year as well. It's just that COVID happened after that. Yeah. Remember that last game? Yeah, where, yeah. You know, he, he smacked North Carolina and was looking yeah. great. You know what I mean? And then COVID happened. So, but this year, I mean, there's a couple things that I think that are that are happening. I think, you know, I like when Coach Beheim plays more people, and I, I like when you know other people contribute. You know, I you know I've been head of the Free Jesse uh, campaign for for a long time. Now, and hey, was, look, making an impact, big time. Listen, he's been playing great, and you know he was put in tough positions there especially towards the end of the season when they played yeah. Georgia Tech you know when he got in and and it was because Dolores I got in foul trouble but he was ready and he he came in and impacted the game and played great the entire game then after that you you have him against you know North Carolina which is arguably one of the best front courts in in not just in the ACC but college in basketball. the in college basketball as a whole and you know they win and he held his own and played well so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to see guys get an opportunity. Um, I think Kadari's been great all year, to be honest with you. I, I sing Kadari's praises. I think he should play more. I've been saying that all year. I, I think he's phenomenal. I mean, even in the last game, you know, at, towards the end, when I was like, what are we doing with this press? Like, why are we keep going right to the quarter? He needs and to be in there. there. Exactly. He, needs he to be has in there. to be in there. So he's, yeah. he, he, he inserts them. He goes in there, he breaks the press by himself. But that's what he would do. I remember it was earlier in the game, you know, um, the point guard was 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 pressing him. And he just, the way that he handled the ball, he switched from one side, switched to the other side. It looked like he, you know, was going to be in trouble, but he just backed up, escaped, dribbled a little bit, came around, yeah, uh, yeah right, but made the play. I'm like, that's what he does. He was comfortable with that. Now, that's not a knock on Gerard because they're different players and they have different strengths. But when a team is pressing, Kadari got to be in there, man. That's it's just that's that's what he does, and he breaks it so effortlessly. And he, it's not like he's he's pressed or anything like that or shaking. You know, some guys when they when they get pressure and you see them tense up, he doesn't tense up at all. Like he's just yeah. ready. So I think I think you know he needs to play more. But I I like the way that he's been playing. Uh, Braswell's been playing great. Um, Come on, big time, right? Big so five. yes, so he's been playing great. And, you know, so really getting those contributions off the bench and playing, um, you know, in a deeper bench, I think that's that's really helped us a lot. I mean, you look at the teams that really had a lot of success. I was looking at the 03 uh, team because, you know, Quick was my guy. And they went like nine deep. They went nine deep. And, and you saw the success that they had. Um, but, yeah, we really utilizing that bench and being able to get guys in there to contribute, I, I think that's really helped us. Yeah, guys are stepping up. I think the zone overall is better. I mean, it takes time. And, you know, it takes time to learn the zone and the rotation sometimes. And I think 
from the beginning to now, like you, you see them, they're quicker, they're, they're sharper guys are getting to the spots and, you know, beating the ball, beating the ball there and the man there. And I think overall, we're just, like you said, we're gelling, but one guy I want to talk about is buddy. I mean, you know, obviously over his last 11 games, he's averaging almost 23 points, mm -hmm. shooting almost 50% from three. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, what do you see in him that that's making a difference, you know, from, I mean, we can talk about from freshman to now the evolution is in his game is uh, it, it's big time, I, I think. And but this season from beginning to now, what have you seen that's the difference in, in this little run he's, he's been on? You know, I, I wrote an article about Buddy, uh, basketballnews.com, and I just wanted to really show a lot of, you know, what he's been dealing with these past three years because I, I haven't really heard him talk about it a lot and the pressure of being the coach's son. And the pressure is real. And, you know, people have been saying, oh, he doesn't deserve to be on the team. He's getting, he's just there because his dad. And, you know, from the moment he stepped in Syracuse, before they even saw him play, they were saying that. And so it, in his freshman year, I mean, he played like a freshman. He had some good games. You can see it there. You know, he had things he needed to work on. But the way that people were, you know, just dogging him. And I wanted to ask him how he handled that. You know, how he was able to, you know, because there's a lot of pressure being the coach's son. You're, everybody's going to say you're getting preferential treatment. You're only playing. And he he answered all the questions in depth. He opened up about it. He said that, you know, I, I, I try to just, you know, stay focused and everything. And, yeah, it is hard. And, yeah, I did hear it, you know. And, but but he, added, he added new dimensions to his game every single year. So his freshman year, he was more of a spot-up shooter. That's what he yeah. was. He, he was a spot up shooter. You could see that he was streaky. You see, he could get hot. He could shoot well. You see, he needed a, you know what I mean? He needed some work with it, but you see, he could shoot. But that was really, you didn't really want him putting on the floor too much. You know, that, you know, he had a little bit of room to grow on his, on the defensive end. That's what yeah. you saw his freshman year. His sophomore year, you saw him add this one dribble pull up and you saw it working effectively, like both ways, you know, right and left. And he would add that to his game. He would add the pump fake because before everybody thinks he's going to just catch it and shoot, he would catch it, pump fake, one dribble, and you're like, oh, okay, buddy. You know what I mean? Like you add that to him. Now this year, you added he's attacking the basket. He's going to the hole sometimes. Then he goes and he's 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 using the screens well. He's he's playing better on defense. He knows how to. In some games he took over, like he literally took over, and you saw the guys trying to find him. Because yes. they, they're trying to find the hot hand. I mean, he, you saw how he blossomed. So, you know, seeing his, his the maturation process, you know, on the court, it's been beautiful to see. And he's such a likable guy as a whole anyway. And I'm going to be honest with you. So I when I went up to I went up to Syracuse, uh, brought my son Malcolm up there with me. And Malcolm, you know, this was like maybe, I guess probably his freshman year, buddy's freshman year. And so, you know, Malcolm was we sitting there talking to him and I'm just checking him out, you know, and Buddy, cause I didn't really know Buddy since he was little and, and Buddy was so personable. He was so cool. He was sitting there chopping up with him. Malcolm was at, and that was before he knew that Malcolm was my son. You know what I mean? He just saw a kid that was there and he was just talking to him. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's cool. Cause you know, a lot of times, and this, and I, I've been in the A, you, you know, they circuit and everything like that. Coach's sons are sometimes some jerks. That's the truth. You yeah. can walk into a gym and see a no whole question. lot of guys playing, and you be like, "Oh, I bet that's the coach's son right there." You know what I mean? You're like, exactly. You just see, and Buddy's not like that. Buddy is a cool person, and, and so he makes you want to root for him. And so when you see him having that success, and you see him with that smile, and you you see the bench chair, like I mean, you can look at the bench and tell how they're happy for him because I've seen different coaches' sons you know, score, and you look at the bench, and they like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I've seen that happen. The bench going crazy when Buddy score. They happy for him and everything like that. So it's, it's, just, it's just great to see him have that success and really to shut people up who are criticizing him. I, I always like when people do that. No, he's a good kid. He, he, he's yeah. a better person than he is player, you right. know. And, and I think the biggest thing that the difference that I see is I mean, obviously, his confidence is through the roof right now. And then he's he's being a little bit more vocal, right? I mean, he's, right. you know, he's trying to get outside of that shell. And, you see, you know, you see him after the game, he's he's talking to the crowd a little bit. You know, he's getting like, come on, man. Like, you, you know, he, he has a little bit of emotion and passion with it. That's It's good to see, man. It's, it's great. You know, you, you, you want to see good things happen to good people, right?
That's right. That's right. It's great to see. What man? What what about it? What is it about the zone in the tournament, man? That you think that just flusters teams? I mean, we saw these first two games, man. These, yeah. it, it, even with like Bob Huggins going against the zone, he went against it before, but they were flustered. That both of these teams. What is it about it? The zone come tourney time, man. West Virginia was throwing the ball away so much that first half. Exactly. I was like, <laughs> what are they doing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they. It's like it, it was. It's tough, you know. I, I had this, yeah. you know, this um, this watch party with like Jason Hart and Demone Brown and Ryan Blackwell, my old guys that I, I played with, and we were talking about it. And Jason Hart was saying how you know it's hard for people to prepare for the zone because even though they played the zone before, they don't play it consistently, and that's why you know Syracuse always you know creeps up on people in the tournament because yeah. people can't adjust to the zone. And you saw that with West Virginia. Like, they, the way they were throwing the ball away, it was like, I was like, wow, they don't know what to do. Not and the even way, close. And the way that we were moving, you know, and the covering the you know, areas and covering the floor. And, you know, I, I thought it was, I thought it's great to see when it's working well. You know, now in the beginning of the year, the zone wasn't looking too good <laughs> for right, a little right, while. Right, I was right. like, oh, what are we doing here in this zone? <laughs> and, but it, but it, but it's like it all started coming together. It all started clicking towards the end. Like you said, it takes a little while sometimes. And it looked great against West Virginia. And honestly, it really did. Yeah, I mean, guys know the rotations better. They're sharper. But I was saying it like in the beginning of the year, and this goes for the zone, man. It, if it's active and you're moving, you're going right. to make up for a lot of the mistakes, the missed rotation just by flying around. And right. you might be late to that weak side when they, you know, trap in the short corner, the guy dives down the middle. You got to get there, and, and if you're just flying around being active, you're you're gonna make up for a lot of those mistakes. Though playing, I agree. Zone. I agree, and they were active, and I love, you know, I, you know, Kadari in the zone. I think he's special when he's in there too because he covers That's so true. much ground and his, uh, you know, long arms and the way that he moves. I mean, I I'm just a big fan of him as a player. You know, to be honest with you, I, I think that he's a player that's always and, and the way that he's handled not playing the minutes that. A lot of people say that he should play, and I'm sure that he feels that he should play. You see him handling it with maturity, and I think that needs to be pointed out because that's tough for you know, especially for a freshman to be yeah. able to to do. Um, you know, so I really applaud the way that he approaches the game on both ends of the floor. But really, his impact. I mean, it's a totally different team when he's there on uh, on, especially on the defensive end. I mean, the yeah. way that he you know penetrates and kicks and looks for somebody. I mean, that was. Like any player would want to play with somebody like that. You know what I mean? Like all he wants to do, like sometimes he overpasses. I'm like, no, Kadari, shoot that. You know what I mean? Lay it up. Yeah. Yeah. He overpasses. I mean, to have a point guard that overpasses, that's that's just special. Because you don't see that that much anymore. It's rare for a freshman to come in and have an impact in the game without scoring the basketball. All right. Right. I mean, right. the hardest position in the game being a point guard, and you to come yeah. in and have that poise and maturity and, and like you said how he's handling everything like you wouldn't even know right you wouldn't even know right he, he, he really is even keel the whole game when you see his face it's just kind of mm -hmm. he, he stays balanced that that's rare man that's why i think he's gonna be he's an nba guy no question oh definitely not even a question i mean the yeah. way the way that the, and the poise and that's the thing he doesn't get rattled so we was talking about with with this with the uh when he got inserted at the end of the game and he can't play he hadn't played for a while and he just very calmly Made the player on the on the on the on the uh, sideline came in there. It's not like it wasn't like he's not rattled. Like they they pick him up full court. He's someone who he could just tell everybody to move and he could just break the press himself. Like you feel a hundred percent confident in him doing that. That's that's special. Once he gets that mid range consistent, whoo, or oh, just that oh, jump man. shot. Yeah, it's over. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So last question: What? So, what do you where do you think we end up? You know, where how, where does this run end? Does it end uh, against Houston, or does it? You know, do we go to the Final Four in the national championship game? So, with Houston, we have to be able to rebound. That is going to yeah. be key for us. Houston is one of the top teams of offensive rebounds. It's like they all go to the boards, and, and a lot of times now, you know, the art of blocking out is a little bit different now. I don't I don't know teams to just go quick to the ball. Or you know to go get the rebound, but they don't. You're not is blocking out as much, and that's the part that you know I'm a little bit concerned about because you have to find a man and box him out when you're playing against a team like Houston because they're all going to the to the especially uh, to the, the zone though, right? Especially in yeah, the zone. 
Right. So that's something that, you know, we're going to have to, I mean, as far as scoring, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll, you know, we, we have a lot of balanced scoring. I'm, I'm a little bit curious to see what's going on with uh, Alan Griffin, though. You know, I'm uh, telling you, he, e, e, I've been, I, what's look, up? <laughs> he, hasn't, Talk to he, me. he hasn't been, I mean, the last four or five games, I've been waiting for him to be aggressive. He's settling on everything. And this not, yeah, this I, not looking in the game. Yeah, it looks like he's looking over his shoulder too. And when you see yeah, no question. starting That's, to do that, you know yeah. they can't, you know, play. But I we know what he can do though. He showed different times during the year. Like he can, no he can take over a game the same way Buddy was taking over a game. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Like he's but you know, once you're looking over your shoulder, it's like it's it, it you know, you can't play like that. He's just gotta say forget it and just play his game. And then the, you know, hopefully once he does one good thing and the next day thing, then he gets to stay in and find his rhythm and everything like that. But you can't play looking over your shoulder, and that, it's, it's just a tough position to be in. To be honest, with you, once you're you're on that, because then nothing goes right. <laughs> like your whole game is different when that happens. But yeah, yeah we definitely need him to be him. Um, but really, I mean, I think one of the main things are going to be rebounding in this next game against Houston, just because of the way they play. I mean, if you watch them against Rutgers, you know they they rebounded the mess out of the ball. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. they, and, they, and how aggressively they attack the rebound. Like, we have to – we have that has to be a point of emphasis. Yeah, and, and I think as we, you know, la- latter part of the season, we started becoming tougher and, and more physical, and we're undefeated when we out-rebound teams. You know, mm. it, we got out-rebounded by North Carolina in this last game against West Virginia, but we were, we're scoring the ball, so it allowed us to, you know, to win those games. But, I mean, 100%, right. if, if we don't rebound the ball and we're not active in the zone, then we're going to be in a tough position. No, I agree. I think we have to play our big guys a little bit more. We, I, I think that especially a team with, you know, I'm, you know, it's, it's frustrating when you see like Jesse get in the game with maybe three minutes, four minutes left in the, in the half. And he's trying to move real quick. I, that's a tough position to be in. Like I, you know, one of the reasons it's interesting because, you know, people were asking me, you know, why, why do I always, you know, and I have big man bias. I'll always say that. You know what I mean? I, I, I'll say that in a heartbeat. I have big man bias. Rightfully but, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. But, you know, I mean, even before, so when I started working with, you know, ESPN Syracuse a couple of years ago, I would be defending Chuku. You know what I mean? Of course, yeah. you know, last year, last year was another year with Sidibe, you know, even have run ins with some, you know what I mean, former players about Sidibe because I understand how the tough position that big men are in sometimes. I mean, you, you don't get the ball. You know, and and you have to play perfect. And if you miss something, it's like, ah, oh, I can't play you. You know what I mean? So, I, so I'm always going to defend the big man. But I, I've seen what Jesse was able to do um, against people who were like you said, going back to North Carolina. They're like one of the top front courts in the, in the country. And I saw him be active and how he was being, how he's able to step right in at Georgia Tech. So you know, it's kind of tough to judge someone when they're you know thrown into the game at, at three minutes left in the first half and they pick up some quick fouls or something like that doesn't go right. It's kind of hard to say, well, you know, he's not ready, and that's why I can't play him. So that's the part where I, I'm like, ah, Coach Bayon, don't do that. You know what I mean? Because, <laughs> so I, 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 so that's why I wrote, a, I wrote an article about, you know, Jesse kind of giving him some love after he had those good games. So I was like, yeah, you're playing great, man. Keep going. Keep your confidence. And, I'm, and I've been talking to them. And, you know, same way I was talking to Sidney Bay last year because – you know, that's how that's how guys deal with me. That's that's what Roosevelt Bowie did with me my freshman year. Otis Hill, uh, Conrad McRae, you know, he, he would, you know, talk to me to like, you know, rest, rest in peace. Um, and he would, you know, speak life into me and speak confidence. I know how important that is. So, again, it's great as a, you know, uh, you know, I'm an OG now. I'm like, you know what I mean? An old head to be able to do that with, you know, the current players. So, I think Jesse's going to be fine. Like, I'm really rooting for for him to really keep keep improving and keep doing well. That's Syracuse family right there. I mean, we we, we look out for is. each other. We root for each other. We, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do, right? I mean, you're supposed to try yeah. to motivate and inspire people. And and, and Jesse for coming sure. in at five, moves Marek to his normal position at the four, and he's able to do more roam roam around a little bit more in that on that perimeter, right. get the rebounds, push. So I I, I, I love what Jesse's been doing. I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Well, E, man, I, I appreciate you coming out. Uh, it's been fun to watch these dudes, man. I hope we continue it, yes. and, um, and hopefully we can get it in again down the road. And and uh, yeah, tell us about your about your podcast real real quick, rematch, and where we can listen to it at. 
All right, cool. So the rematch, I, I write and I um, have a, my podcast, The Rematch, uh, on basketballnews.com. Uh, that's what I do. I also write for The Guardian. And, um, you know, I keep myself busy. Keep myself busy. Let me ask you this. Why are our games so late, though? I mean, I, the game starts at, like, 10 o'clock. I'm like, thank God I got to take a nap first before the game comes on. You know I mean, what I mean? We're not on the West Coast, East. Why, why are they so late, man? Man, they I mean, that late. I, I, I have no clue, but but it, it it is it is irking me a little bit. Oh, well, the I'll be there man. watching though. I just gotta take a nap first. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. E man, I appreciate you, man, for sure. It's all love. No problem, man. And keep doing your thing for real, man. I love what you're doing with this podcast and everything. So keep keep the interviews coming.